Welcome back to The Shepherd's Pie, a slice of hope to raise faithful kids. I'm Tony Kolank, a law school professor, a columnist for Practical Homeschooling Magazine, and author of the Harwood Mysteries inspirational fiction series. By the way, I've been thrilled with the big release of book four in that series last month. It's called The Merchant's Curse. It would make a great Christmas gift for that high school or middle school student in your life, so check it out on my website. On today's show, we're going to be discussing how to help young people identify falsehood and seek the truth in this world. My guest is author and editor Mary Woods, who has written a science fiction novel involving a tattoo artist on an alien world who has broken his oath only to paint the truth. My guest today is Mary Woods, author of the newly released sci-fi novel, Mark Maker by Prism Press. She was homeschooled in the Chicago suburbs and then headed west to Wyoming Catholic College. And uh, there she studied the great books and did lots of fun things like climbing mountains. And after graduating summa cum laude with a bachelor's degree in liberal arts, she returned to the Midwest and has been working as an academic textbook editor and also as an editorial assistant for the literary magazine Dappled Things. Mary, welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you very much. I should also say I got a chance to know Mary a little bit at the Catholic Writers Guild conferences that we uh, have been attending the last few years and uh, right. was really excited to uh, see you get your book released. I remember uh, meeting you that first time when you were still kind of imagining this book, I think. <laughs> yeah, maybe not even imagining it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Could be, but you've worked quickly on this. So why don't you talk a little bit about your background and you know, how did you get into writing? I kind of knew I would be a writer for a long time. I was one of those kids who was always reading and telling stories and eventually started writing those stories down. <laughs> Most of my writing was kind of in the fantasy vein. I kind of got into science fiction a bit later. Yeah, but the fantastical worlds has always kind of been my my thing so and now you've got your own science fiction novel published by uh chrism press mark maker uh let's just talk a few minutes what's the premise of the novel it's about this alien race and their culture kind of revolves around this whole tradition of ceremonial tattoos everyone gets pretty much from the day that they're born get these different marks for important life events and accomplishments. And so all of these important things, and they're not just records, they are also sort of bound up with this culture's religion almost. Obviously, these aliens are not Christian or anything like that, but they do have sort of this sort of this understanding of a natural religion or just a natural understanding of spiritual things. So that's kind of bound up in their tattoo culture as well. The tattoo artists in this culture, the mark makers, are obviously very important figures, and they all have to take an oath to tell the truth with the marks that they make. So the main character of the novel is one of these tattoo artists who finds himself in a situation where he's coerced into giving a mark of exile to a man that he believes is innocent. And now he believes that he's broken his oath, but he's too afraid to tell anyone for fear that he will also be punished and and exiled. That's kind of where the story starts. And then he has to figure out what he's going to do, both about the corruption that he's discovered in his own society and this crime that he's essentially committed, how he's going to atone for it. Now, the idea of the tattoo maker is pretty neat. I mean, of course, when I was growing up, it seemed tattoos had a stigma attached to them but nowadays everybody (laughs) if you don't have a tattoo there's something the matter with you it seems (laughs) for Um, the record for the record I have no tattoos and no particular interest in getting one but (laughs) well that's what I was I wasn't about to ask you that (laughs) but since you answered it I guess that's good but no I was I was gonna ask why a tattoo maker that's a little bit of an, an interesting backstory actually the original idea for this alien race that had all these tattoos was actually not something I came up with originally. <laughs> the credit goes to a friend of mine from college. Uh, his name is Don and Scholl. And he created this tabletop role-playing game. And it was a sci-fi setting, had a lot of different factions and alien races. So one of these races was 
the the Noxine, who they played a different role in the story. I didn't like write the story that we played in the game. I kind of took the setting and some of the bones of the world building and kind of wrote my own story in that same setting. But yeah, the initial inspiration for the story when I was thinking about this alien race, the Noxine and their culture with all these tattoos, and I was just thinking about it one day, like, you know, what would it actually be like to live in a culture like that? And what kind of social pressures would that put on a person? And what would happen if this is kind of the structure of the law and the way that people indicate truth about themselves and about the world? You know, what would happen if you somehow got or gave a tattoo that you knew was false? Essentially, what kinds of moral dilemmas would arise in this specific kind of society? Uh, and that just seemed to hold a ton of dramatic possibilities. <laughs> so that does bring us to this idea of truth and falsehood, which I know we want to talk about here, especially in relation to you know young people today. So tell me a little bit, how do you explore these ideas of truth and falsehood in the plot you know, of your book and in your character's situation? So there's a couple different threads to the plot, and I will try to describe them without giving too much away. <laughs> there's the plot with you know the main character, this tattoo artist who you know realizes that he's made this false mark, and that kind of leads him into this journey of he starts visiting the exiles. I don't think I mentioned this before, but all the aliens live on this this huge like generation ship world ship. So all the exiles, all the criminals that are cast out of society, they live like on the lowest levels of the ship as like slave laborers. So the main character starts secretly visiting this realm of the exiles to see what it's like down there. And he ends up discovering, you know, there are a lot of people down there who don't deserve to be down there. Either they were outcast unjustly, or, you know, a lot of them were born there. And so they live these horrible, harsh lives, even though they did nothing wrong. So this starts really making him rethink, what is my role as a truth teller? What should I be doing to help these people to address this injustice that no one seems to be acknowledging. How does he even know in your society there, what is truth, as Pontius Pilate might ask, you know, mm-hmm. what, mm-hmm. And what is the truth in these things? And, you know, how do you know if something is false in your right. world building there? Yeah, well, he, he comes from a very, this very ancient and strict tradition of kind of law, this alien race, they're really just sort of bound up with honoring their ancestors. Um, and like keeping all the laws and traditions that were passed down to them. So that is what he's been taught is truth. But as he goes to the story, he starts to discover not that everything about the tradition he's been given is bad, but just that people fall through the cracks and that the law, it's not always flexible enough to be compassionate to the people who need it. You know, it's interesting is as you're talking about this society, I'm actually thinking of parallels in our own society right now and in our youth today, maybe in every generation, looking at the institutions that they grow up around with a lot of doubt in their minds, to quote one particular person, you know, maybe fake news, you know, that (laughs) there's a lot of skepticism that they can believe the traditions and the religious practices that they've been handed down. And it sounds like your tattoo artist is struggling with the same problem. And from what you're describing, it sounds like he discovers that, in fact, he cannot trust the truths that have been handed down. Yeah, well, that was really interesting because (laughs) I actually specifically did not want to write a story with a protagonist who completely threw out the tradition he'd grown up with. Because, you know, my own experience growing up as a young Catholic, I do have the Catholic tradition, which my parents handed on to me. But obviously figuring out exactly how to live that out in such a confusing and sometimes unsettling world, you know, sometimes you don't feel like you've been given, like your tradition has given you all the tools. Or maybe you you need to dig deeper before you really find out how to live the truth rather than just learning the the rules. Does your main character ever sort of find a truth that he can cling to? Yes, I would say so. So, you know, he's struggling with what is the truth and can I trust the tradition that I've been given? 
And through all this like process of struggling and doubt, he does end up discovering the sort of a like an old mentor hermit character who's like part of the same clan, but he's a little bit mysterious. He's like an artist, but he kind of does his own thing. <laughs> Eventually, you know, he ends up learning from this this mentor, uh, kind of an older, like deeper tradition that most of the rest of society has forgotten about. It sounds like the world that your tattoo artist is growing up in might be similar to kind of the secularized world that our teens are growing up in now. And there's this more ancient truth out there that is maybe difficult for us to find. Let me ask you this. You're not that far removed from your teenage years, I don't think. (laughs) No. Um, You know, what were some of the things you saw as you were growing up that helped form your idea of truth and falsehood that you were able to work into this novel? I think I definitely had a sense in my teenage years, and I mean, still, I don't know, almost like looming apprehension or danger about the future, especially in the larger society or sort of in the in our country. Uh, I mean, growing up as a Catholic in a very secular world, a little bit of a like embattled mentality, <laughs> uh, which I guess is not too surprising. But I did. I struggled and you know, still do in some ways struggle with, yeah, a lot of uncertainty about, you know, the future and sort of like leadership, both leadership in like politics and in the church and just wondering who to trust and wondering like (laughs) whether, you know, can you, can you trust God with the future? I mean, that's a big question, especially in the past few tumultuous (laughs) years. That's like been an anxiety that's been on a lot of people's minds. Um, And that a lot of that definitely went into this story is kind of, you know, a person who doesn't have a lot of influence on the grand scale of things in terms of changing the culture or being able to change the direction of like the politics or the culture war or whatever. So that but telling a story from the perspective of a person who is facing all these seemingly impossible problems. So what do you do as an individual? How do you act with integrity and in the truth? And that may be, you know, it's a very difficult thing internally, as well as, you know, the external consequences. And it's not just you, and it's not just uh, your character, and it's not just adults today. I mean, this has been ongoing. Like I said, I I quoted from Pontius Pilate earlier, right? You know, (laughs) what is truth? I mean, this is something that people have struggled with forever. What are some of the answers do you think that your character uncovers and in his own quest to figure out, well, what is really true in this world? What can I trust as true? The resolution of the story doesn't really have to do with like him overturning the corruption or beating the bad guys. Because sometimes we don't get to see that in our own lives. Justice does come, but sometimes it takes a long, a long time. Yeah, my protagonist in the story finds more of his answers through, you know, just acting with integrity towards individuals in like the face to face encounters with the people that he's actually responsible for. That's pretty neat because this idea then that you know, even as you're trying to uncover the truth, if you act yourself in truth and with integrity, that that will help you, you know, on this journey, just in your own actions, remaining true to yourself, I suppose. Well, not just true to yourself, but yeah, true to kind of that, that inner compass. One of the things that I found really fascinating to explore as, as a character, I, I'm always fascinated by this when I see it in other stories as well, but a character who who has a very strong conscience or moral compass to the point where he starts doing things following his conscience that he doesn't really want to do. (laughs) You know, he kind of resists, he almost resists his own good desires and intentions, you know, mostly out of fear, the consequences, but he also like almost can't help himself because he has this, you know, innate knowledge ultimately God-given knowledge of the truth and can't, just can't ignore it. (laughs) Yeah, I think we're really onto something here, though. You know, when you talk about conscience and innate knowledge, 
Uh, and how can we find the truth? How can our young people find the truth today if they follow their conscience? I guess even Disney knew this, right? With Jiminy <laughs> Cricket, always let your conscience be your guide and you'll find the truth. But I wonder how your character in the world that he grew up in, that was apparently filled with lies about the truth, how was his conscience even formed in a way where he could identify truth? Because I think it's similar to you know, kids today who might just be bombarded in the media with certain messages, you know, how are we supposed to expect that they will be able to intuit the truth, if you will, through their conscience in a world like this or like your characters? Yeah, that's always, I think, a really difficult question. And obviously, formation of conscience and of a sense of what is right and wrong is, it is incredibly important. Yeah, I don't know if I have a definitive answer to that, except God can still work through that. And there's still room for grace, even <laughs> among people who have been raised with a, a sort of distorted sense of right and wrong. There's still that natural law that's kind of written in our hearts. Right. Um, that, Sometimes uh, it takes a like a drastic event in someone's personal life to awaken that, I think. So, uh, yeah, so maybe that's, uh, that's part of the answer, too. It does take a lot to distort humanity or uh, the race of your rational person so much that, you know, what's written on our hearts is so distorted, I suppose. What about falsehood? How does uh, your character identify what is false in his world? Yeah, I mean, there, there are a couple, a few different ways that he kind of deals with falsehood. I mean, that's sort of the inciting event in one way, because uh, he gives this mark of exile to a person who doesn't deserve it. And so he he knows that's false, but isn't sure at first what to do about it. And then he, you know, also finds himself in other situations. So in the in the larger plot of the story, there's there's sort of this political conflict that's going on in the larger world, a political faction called the Ascendants. And they're essentially fighting a war to retake what they believe are their ancient home planets from this other alien race who happen to be actually humans. <laughs> so they're fighting this war with the humans, but they've gotten to kind of desperate straits in a way. So the faction is really, really doing anything they can to further the war effort. And this ends up coming into conflict with the guild of tattoo artists, essentially the Ascendance wants to give certain tattoos to their warriors sort of as a, a propaganda move. And the guild has determined, you know, the battle that you want to honor them for was not actually worth honoring. It wasn't a fair fight. So we're not going to give those tattoos because that's not what happened. And then, yeah, there's kind of this this showdown between the mark makers and this this faction that wants to use the tattoos for their own ends to basically shape the truth to their own advantage. That's such a fascinating way that you set that up, that conflict there, because I do think that is something that, you know, young people and older people are encountering today too, is, mm -hmm. you know, they're being told you have to subscribe to certain truths and, you know, their conscience and their common sense may tell them, no, that yeah, I'm not going to do this. Um, but I suppose your character must learn that there's a cost that comes with kind of bucking the system in, in the oh, name yes. of truth. <laughs> yes, uh, there's definitely consequences. And I mean, there's a lot of pressure to just go with the flow, go with who's in power, not just because they sort of have the, the power to shut you down or make you disappear. <laughs> but, you know, in in kind of the larger context of the world, you know, all this alien society, they've been living on these spaceships for generations, um, and they, they really want to live on the planets again. They really want to have a better life for themselves and their children. So there's a lot riding on this conflict, and obviously the people in power are using that to justify these falsehoods that they're putting forward. So wow. it gets very yeah. complicated. <laughs> it does, but life gets complicated also. As, as we're kind of wrapping up this part of the discussion, you know, and, and we look at it, the landscape of truth and falsehood today and, and our youth and our society, what are some things that we could do, whether we're young or old, that will help us to stay on that course of the truth 
and avoid falsehood. I guess some things that have kind of helped me in my own perspective, just participating in the life of the church and remembering that the conflicts and confusions that we're seeing right now have not always been here and will not last forever as much as it may seem like it sometimes. <laughs> kind of taking both a longer perspective in that way and also focusing on the present. You know, what good can you do for the people who are actually in your life? How can you live out the truth just in your own individual life, even if it seems like the world is crumbling around you? <laughs> Very, you know, obviously easier said than done. I think that's what we're all called to, ultimately. Yeah, ultimately, I think your answer is wise beyond your years, right? <laughs> uh, you know, live live a life of truth in areas where you can have some control and take the long perspective on this. Because, yeah, if you go back and look over even church history, you realize there were a heck of a lot worse situations and, and more confusion over what was true in the oh, first yes. few centuries of the truth than what we're struggling with in 2022, mm -hmm. even though it might seem monumental to us right now. And I do think you're right, taking that longer perspective. And if our youth were to, you know, have a better foundation in the history of even the history of the church, I think that yeah. would be clear yeah, to history, them. History is a big one. It is good yeah. to know history. <laughs> and that's, I think, also a great segue into our entertainment segment. All right, in our entertainment segment today, I always ask our guests to recommend a uh, book or movie that they think might be a uh, good item for a young person today. And uh, I understand, Mary, that you have brought us something that actually flows nicely into the theme we've been talking about with truth and falsehood. Yeah, my recommendation is The Giver by Lois Lowry, a bit of an older YA novel. But for those who aren't familiar with the premise, it's kind of a dystopian story about a young man who lives in a seemingly perfect society where all, uh, you know, conflicts and disease and all these other, you know, normal human sufferings have seemingly been eradicated. So this young man is, you know, assigned everyone, their roles in the in the society are assigned to them. So he is assigned to be basically the apprentice of this old man called the giver. He quickly begins learning from the giver that this is not always the way that the world was <laughs> and that there's actually many things that are unjust in the society that he's, that he's living in and less human about the society that he's living in. So his eyes are really opened and then he has to decide, you know, how he's going to act on this new knowledge. Why do you think this is such a great book for young people to read today? And I know they made a movie of it, too. I remember seeing and was very in impressed with the movie. Yeah, it's a really beautiful movie. I think it's a very relatable story for young people. I forget how old the main character is exactly, but I think it's a, you know, a teenager. Just coming to terms with, you know, again, this theme we've been talking about of, you know, I've been raised with these beliefs and things I've been taught about my society. but now. I'm learning these new things and my conscience is telling me that this is wrong. <laughs> How am I supposed to act when I have these expectations that society has for me about the norms, but then I have this deeper sense of, no, this is wrong. Yeah. And I do think you can't get enough of that if you're a teenager and you're forming your conscience to see people who are, are willing to stand up to society for what is right. Uh, what age range would you say The Giver would be best for as far as a teenager? How young would you go with that one? Maybe 11 or 12 at the youngest, um, up through teenage years. The writing, if I remember correctly, the writing style is pretty, you know, it's very well written, but it's also fairly simple. It's not too complicated for, a, you know, sort of younger end of the teen spectrum, but definitely has enough substance to it for, for older readers as well. Wonderful. All right. So The Giver, and actually there's four books in that series, if I recall. The Giver series by Lois Lowry is our recommendation. 
Um, all right. So Mary, as we wrap up then, if our listeners are interested in getting a hold of Mark Maker or learning more about you, where should they go? Yes. So I have my author website, which is maryjessicawoods.com. And then I also have social media pages on Facebook and Instagram. My handle is the same, my name, Mary Jessica Woods. So you can find me there. And then uh, you can purchase Mark Maker from my publisher, Chrism Press. So that's chrismpress.com. And it's also available on the major online book retailers. So Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Well, it's been a real pleasure having you on the show today, Mary. I really appreciate you coming on and I I wish you uh, all the best with this, the first of, I'm sure, many novels that we're going to be seeing from you over the years. I hope so. (laughs) Thank you very much. All right. And that is all the time we have for the show today. We've been speaking with Mary Woods about truth and falsehood and our youth. Again, this is Anthony Brown-Colank. If you have a question for me or a topic you'd like me to cover, drop me a line on my website at antonycolank.com, and you can learn more about uh, me and my historical fiction series, The Harwood Mysteries, there. Until next time, may God bless you and your families as we work together to raise faithful kids. (laughs) 